So yeah, before we begin, uh, I would uh, like to take your consent for recording this uh, webinar, and this recording would be available to all the members of STFC Food Network. So welcome, welcome everyone. Um, I'm Professor Sonal Chaudhary. I'm a Principal Investigator, PI, for STFC Food Network. And many of you would know the network and what it does because you are members of the network. But just very briefly, uh, it, within the network, we are trying to look into different challenges in the food systems from production to uh, manufacturing, supply chain, and consumer behavior, and trying to address that through the different capabilities of SDFC, which is in the data science, in different sort of technologies, and different facilities that SDFC has. So in that regard, um, today's March webinar is on understanding the role of additives in chocolate manufacturing. And we have our speakers, two very good speakers uh, from our network. Uh, one is uh, Dr. Daniel Hobson, and he is Executive Director of Edinburgh Complex Fluids Partnership. And uh, our second speaker is Dr. Seden Tadesse, who is a senior computational scientist at Hartree Center as a part of chemistry and material team. We are very, very delighted to have you both here for our webinar. And uh, over to you guys. Uh, we would be fetching questions through chat. So if there are any questions, please feel free to put, uh, put that across the chat. And um, Cindy would be able to collate those um, information and uh, provide the question and answer round towards the end. Um, of the webinar, there would be an opportunity to, like you know, to interact with the speakers towards the end of webinar. So over to you, Daniel and Seden. Great, thanks so much. So uh, let me share the screen. Okay. Great. I'm assuming everyone can see that. Yep. Excellent. Thanks. Okay, great. Well, I'll just give you a very quick overview of what we're going to talk about today. So this, this talk's going to be um, split in two. I'm going to start off giving some of the, the project context and background and some of the, uh, the work we've been doing on, on dense suspension rheology and, and uh, with specific reference to, to chocolate, um, looking at the, the role of friction, um, before I hand over to Seddon, who's going to go through the, the specifics of the, the molecular dynamic simulations that she's been doing uh, at Hartree uh, and hopefully kind of show you that, that together we've, you know, we're, we're making some progress to be able to, to um, describe the dense suspension rheology from a kind of molecular level um, description upwards. And we'll finish with a kind of project outlook of, of where we're going next and where we can take this, this kind of joint, joint new capability beyond chocolate. Um, so the kind of the, the, the key message that I just wanted to sort of get over uh, throughout this, this talk is that between ECFP and SDF Hartree, we've developed this, this capability, hoping to engage with industry. Um, what we're really trying to do is span the molecular level interactions right through up to the kind of bulk material properties. Um, so yeah, I, my name's uh, Daniel Hodgson. I'm the di director of ECFP, which I'll, I'll give a very brief introduction to in, in a moment. So by training, I'm an experimental soft matter physicist. Uh, I've got a background in, in dense suspension rheology, so things like chocolate, concrete, um, ceramic paste and things. Uh, and I did my PhD on looking at the link between these and, and granulation, which is often used in, in pharmaceutical and agricultural uh, manufacturing. Um, and as part of my role, I'm, in, I'm inter really interested in industrial challenges, in particular looking for cross-sector solutions um, for, from the underlying physics. And Seddon um, is a senior computational scientist from SDFC Hartree. Uh, by training, she's a um, molecular um, simulator and, and chemical engineer. Um, and she did her PhD on, on uh, polymers at liquid liquid interfaces. And it, similarly to myself, she's also interested in, in kind of in industry led challenges, um, particularly in, in looking at innovation in materials. And she's part of the materials and chemistry team uh, at Hartree. So just to, to give very brief, um, broader background uh, to, to the kind of the project and the approach we've taken. Um, so in general, at ECFP, uh, we study complex fluids, which is another name for soft matter or more generally goo. 
Uh, so complex fluids are essentially just liquids with bits in, and these bits can take various different forms. So I've shown a few examples here. So you have liquids with particles in, liquids with another uh, non, uh, non-miscible liquid, uh, surfactants, polymers, and we also um, have a quite a lot of uh, uh, biological physics going on, whether the, the bits might be uh, microorganisms or other um, uh, biological uh, uh, actives. And one of the, the key roles of ECFP is to, is to be able to sort of match up the underlying physics, the underlying understanding of some of these systems with industry challenges. So if you look around different sectors, um, many of these soft matter uh, complex fluids are, are used in a range of different applications. So we can see concrete, uh, salad dressing emulsion, uh, you might have um, liquid hand soap formulations um, for cleansing, hand gels, which we've had a lot of in the last couple of years, and, and wastewater processing. So in all of these industries, uh, to formulate and to, to give the kind of sensory and, and also functional properties of a lot of these, these products, you need some understanding of the, the soft matter physics. Um, so in terms of length scale, uh, as soft matter physicists, we kind of sit between the, the kind of molecular level description right up to the, the kind of bulk um, flow. So what we're trying to do is to, to take the microscopic understanding and then look at how emergent behavior um, develops and, and then be able to sort of describe that in a uh, kind of with a constitutive equation or something that then might be useful to, to engineers if they're, they're trying to flow this on a, on a kind of much, much larger scale, uh, trying to really bridge those, those huge uh, range of length scales in, in between. Um, and complex fluids, they, they crop up everywhere in our daily lives, um, from personal care products to, to, to food, to automotive lubricants and things, and, and uh, construction and, and uh, things like paints. Um, one of the interesting things from my perspective is that many of the challenges faced by these industries aren't sector specific. So things like sustainability, uh, clean label, where you're trying to reduce the number of uh, ingredients or, or sort of things that consumers don't like. And things like robust formulation, which we've seen as a sort of increasing uh, problem in recent years where supply chains have been you know, seriously challenged by you know, COVID or um, blockages in the Suez Canal, for instance. So there's a, this idea that you might want to create a formulation which can take a range of different material inputs and still give you the, the kind of resultant rheology or, or functional uh, properties out the other, other side. Um, and it's just to point out in the UK, this is a... a a huge uh, business. So it was estimated in 2018 that this generated something like 180 billion pounds of net sales. And within that sector, food is a huge element. I think also in 2018, it was estimated something like 28 billion pounds. And it's the, the single largest manufacturing sector in, in the UK. So it's, uh, it's, it's important. So ECFP, um, we're, we're based in the, the, the School of Physics and Astronomy at Edinburgh. And essentially what we, we do is partner with uh, external organizations, usually companies, uh, to, to solve their challenges. Um, but crucially, the arrows here are pointing it you know, two ways. So we, we're transferring knowledge out of the group, but, but crucially, we're transferring knowledge and new questions into the group for academics to work on. And it's been a really fruitful way of working over the, the last 10, 10 years or so that we've, we've been in existence. And of course, many of the, the challenges coming from industry are, are not um, siloed down into our one school in, in physics. So we're increasingly working with, with different schools across the, across the university, but, but increasingly with, with external institutions as well to be able to, to, to challenge these interdisciplinary, um, to, to tackle these interdisciplinary challenges. Um, so as, as director, I'm, I'm kind of responsible for, for growing and managing ECFP. And we've got this vision of becoming a, a sort of leading global center for physics-driven formulation. Um, and we have quite a, a sort of unique way in which we're, we're set up. So we engage with industry in a whole range of different ways. So we can kind of do small feasibility studies and consultancy right through to, to multi-year collaborative research. And one of the ways that we're able to do that is by having a, a permanent academic staff of, of um, uh, postdocs who, who work with me. Um, and some of these work on, on business development and, and short-term projects. And, and other of my colleagues work on kind of longer-term uh, collaborations where we might get much much more in, in depth into the science and we're also supported by uh, an impact research officer who helps us develop you know get, gather evidence and develop impact case studies for, for things like REF and we've been fairly successful over the years so that's just a few metrics you know we've worked more than 55 companies across 12 sectors and we've generated quite a few million pounds worth of, of income 
Um, so I'll just very briefly hand over to Seddon to, to give you a background to, to the Hartree. Uh, hello, everyone. So um, Hartree Centre is uh, part of the Science and Technology Facilities Council. It's kind of spinned out from the scientific computing department within STFC. And it the, the why exist is so that we can link the academic way of working from the scientific department into the industry. So um, we have a mission of uh, adapting high performance computing, uh, big data and AI for uh, to accelerate this adaptation to industry. So within Hartree, we've got a few platforms. So we've got an Intel high performance computing, quantum computing, also uh, cloud computing facilities. And within Hartree, we're actually um, based with a few people that are working at IBM. So we work very closely with them for specific industrial um, challenges we have. And we're also working with other institutes like Alan Turing Institute and Royce Institute to work together on such high performance computing and data science challenges. And I am based within the materials and chemistry group. We mainly focus on the materials discovery part and applying um, computational chemistry tools like molecular dynamics. So we work mainly with the companies like Unilever and John Samati, uh, but there are people within the other groups that work on data science and AI that work with, for example, with NHS and Airbus and so on. So, Daniel, thank you. Thanks. So then to take us onto this specific context of this project. So the, the kind of overarching aim really was to try and form a, a, a new capability between ECFP and the Hartree Center. So leveraging the, the, the uh, experimental uh, expertise and capabilities we have up here in Edinburgh, with the, the molecular dynamics and computational facilities that, that Hartree have. Um, and really it was specifically focused on, on being able to, to tackle emerging industry challenges. And the kind of the main uh, sort of driver here is is really sustainability. So you know, across many many different sectors, um, companies are, are you know trying to replace petrochemically derived uh, products with with um, either natural or, or um, sustainable alternatives. Um, but this is a, a, a mammoth task, um, and it's in particular hindered um, in some some cases because of a lack of understanding of what the current formulation is to, is is doing. Often these formulations might have been in existence for you know 40 plus years, um, but there's there's now real pressure to change them. So, so companies are having to, to uh, look again at, at what some of these functional ingredients are doing, what role they're, they're actually playing, um, and uh, before they're able to, to reformulate. So we decided in, in this project to use chocolate as an exemplar. Um, in part because the team here at ECFP, we've worked on chocolate for a number of years. We have a, had a you know a good understanding of of the system. It's, it's so the, the model system here I can show you is, is kind of made up of of a um, sucrose particle suspended in in liquid oil. These sucrose particles are approximately ten microns in size, so they're they're non Brownian, um, and we've got. In this this specific case, we've got a single uh, additive added, which is this phospholipid lecithin, um, which is added during the, the processing stage. So, it's a relatively simple system, three components, um, but it has you know a very very interesting applications, but also very interesting rheology, um, which we've studied for a number of years. And really, what the the sort of key question from from this particular project was: can we can we get from a molecular level description of the system? To understanding the bulk rheology, which we we we, you know, we we have a good handle on, both in terms of experiments and uh, higher level simulations, which I'll discuss shortly. Um, so, as I mentioned, we we worked on this for a number of years. We had a a, a large project funded by Mars Chocolate and also EPSRC, and we published some of this work in in twenty nineteen in PNAS. Um, and a lot of the the simulator, sorry, a lot of the um, experimental data I'll discuss today comes comes from that work. Um, so, first of all, I'll just very briefly take you through some of the background around dense suspension rheologies. Um, so, if you think about a, a volume represented by this square, 
you can add particles to this. Um, you keep on increasing particles until you uh, can't add any, add any more. This point is, is called phi m, which is the, the maximum packing volume fraction. So a kind of random assortment of particles fills this space, you can't, can't get any more in. Um, and if we measure the rheology of this system as we increase the, the volume fraction, um, so here I'm showing volume fraction phi along the, the bottom, um, and I'm showing the, the relative viscosity, so that's the, the viscosity of the system normalized by the, the solvent viscosity on the y-axis. Um, and we can see that as we increase the volume fraction, the, uh, the relative vis viscosity increases uh, dramatically. And across a whole range of different systems, a whole range of different chemistries, particle uh, shapes, sizes, this kind of behavior is well described by the krieger doherty relation, um, which essentially has two, two parameters within it. Phi, which is a kind of a decision that the, the formulator makes about how much solid you put in, so that's the volume fraction, and phi m, which is this maximum volume fraction. And we find that if we plot this and fit it to the data, uh, we get very good sort of empirical agreement between the Krieger doherty and, and the data across a whole range of, of different systems. So you can see that as a, as a formulator, you have two options if you want to change the viscosity. You can either change, change phi, solid volume fraction, or you can try and change phi m, which is this maximum volume fraction. And that's really what the, the purpose of this talk is about, is, is understanding how, how to change phi m. Um, so why are people interested in, the, in this maximum uh, volume fraction? Well, one of the key things is that it sets the point by which the, the system can no longer flow. So you can see on, on the, the graph on the, the left-hand side that the, the viscosity diverges at phi m. Um, we can see some experimental data on the right, which is a system um, increasing in solid volume fraction. And you can see that beyond 55 volume percent, it transitions to a from a, from a flowing suspension to a, to a granular regime. So there's a, there's a change in the, in the behavior. Um, and often in industry, you know, for various reasons, you might be trying to get as much solid in there. Um, depending on the sector, there's different pressures to, to, to do this, but often you find that, that um, industry you're trying to, to formulate right up against the edge of this, this phi m. So it's, it's useful to know where it is and how you might modify it. Um, so in recent years, there's been a kind of paradigm shift in the understanding of such systems. Um, and one of the key things that we, we now understand is that the, the friction, the interparticle friction is important in, in driving the maximum packing volume fraction. So here, so here I'm showing some simulation data on the, on the left, and you can see the, the black curve um, is a, an infinite friction coefficient, which, is respond, which is corresponds to this, this panel on top where you've got a shift in uh, a shift between flowing suspension and granulation at around uh, between 55 and 60%. Um, and you can also simulate the frictionless case where, where particles have um, no, no interparticle friction. And experimentally, we can, we can realize this um, along this bottom panel. You can see that, that phi m has, has shifted up uh, considerably. I won't go into the details of how we realize this experimentally, but, um, but that, that's the kind of underlying physics there. Um, so in the kinds of simulations that are done here, mu p, the, the friction coefficient, is basically just a, a, an input variable that you, you, you can vary. Um, but there's not much kind of underlying physics about what, what that actually means for, this, for the system. Um, and in uh, 2018, we, we kind of brought out, uh, we brought out this paper um, generalizing this, this constraints-based approach where really what, what we said was that the the difference between the, the frictionless case and the frictional case is that in the frictionless case, particles can slide past each other. And in the, the frictional case, particles are constrained to roll past each other. And there was a kind of um, stress dependent criterion which turned on and off this constraint. Um, and in, in the literature, there's, there's still um, a sort of ongoing debate about what the nature, the sort of specific nanoscopic description of, of this, this contact is and what the nature of that is. Um, and that, that's that's still missing. So in part, what this, this project is doing is trying to get to the, the, the details of what that is. So to take you back to chocolate um, and to look at this phi m, re really what chocolate making is, is engineering maximum packing. So in the top panel here, um, 
we can see that what's called the crunching process in chocolate, where you, you add all of your raw materials at the start, you put it in a, a, a big mixer, typically a planetary mix or something like that. And out, out the other end, after some, some considerable mixing time and energy, you get this nice flowing chocolate. Crucially, this is a constant phi. So you add all of the material at the start and you end up with flowing chocolate at the end. Whereas if we compare that to the bottom panel, for, uh, what we're doing here is, is explicitly changing the volume fraction, but you can see that the kind of behavior is the same. At, at, at low at low fi, we have this flowing suspension. At high fi, we've got this granular suspension. And conversely, at low mixing time, we've got this granular suspension. And, and at high, high mixing time, we've got this um, flowing suspension. So that if we think back to the krieger doherty relation, if this is at constant phi, then the sort of inference is that we've, we've engineered phi and we've changed phi m through this mixing process. Um, and we did some, some work on this, trying to understand um, the, the, the sort of underlying physics here. I, I won't take you through all of this now, but essentially what we did was to compare this to a study back in um, the, the 60s by Lewis and Nielsen, in which they systematically uh, increased the aggregation size of, of some glass spheres, and they could see that uh, they got a commensurate shift in, in phi m. So we kind of take this, this analysis um, and then apply it to the chocolate and then the kind of inferences that it's the crunching is increasing phi m by breaking up aggregates. So the, the other part to, to, to chocolate making and this engineering uh, uh, maximum packing is, is that in, in typical chocolate making, they, they add lecithin, uh, this, this phospholipid. And the conventional understanding up, up until recently was that lecithin promotes the wetting of sucrose surfaces and acts as a steric stabilizer. Um, but in the paper we brought out in 2019, we actually showed that the, the, the true role of lecithin is to change the friction coefficient. So the, the graph here on the, on the right, sorry, on the, on the left, um, we have a system at constant volume fraction, but increasing lecithin concentration um, along the bottom. And we've got the, the high shear viscosity uh, on the y-axis. And we see that it, it, the, 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 the high shear viscosity and, and consequently the, the, the friction coefficient decreases as we increase the lecithin coefficient. And we can kind of understand this um, on this previous graph I showed. So if we start off on the, the black curve, as we decrease the friction coefficient and increase phi m, we can see that for a constant volume fraction, you drop down to lower and lower viscosities. So the understanding is that uh, the lesser that reduces friction between sucrose surface sucrose particles. Um, so to make make progress this, we've we've been working with uh, one of my colleagues here in Edinburgh, uh, Chris Ness, who's in the School of Engineering. Um, Chris does uh, discrete element modeling or DEM. Um, and we've been working with Chris for a number of years, uh, comparing um, his simulations to experiments. We have very good agreement. So in the discrete element model, um, modeling that Chris does, particles interact via uh, short range lubrication and, and contact friction. So um, as particles come together, there's a critical cutoff distance at which point the lubrication film uh, breaks in the simulation and friction kicks in. So friction is currently input by this, this single value uh, uh, mu, which, which happens beyond this, this critical um, contact force. So this is, this is kind of called the, the critical load model. You kind of see a plot of mu against FC uh, here. So it just jumps up to a, to a finite value at some, some FC. So there's excellent agreement between DEM and, and experiment, but the, the, the kind of values of mu and FC are, are, are kind of input variables. There isn't much understanding or science beneath them. Um, so, you know, again, going back to the, the kind of purpose of this project, we, we have good agreement between the kind of molecular, sorry, between the discrete element modeling that, that Chris does um, and the kind of experiments that, that, that I do. Um, you know, we're able to match the high shear um, limiting viscosities very well. And then really what we want to be able to do is to, from, um, from the molecules up, be able to use that to generate input parameters to put it into DEM to kind of close this, close this loop. So now I'll hand over to uh, Seddon to take you through some of the molecular dynamic simulations. Thank you, Daniel. So I'm gonna share my slide. So hopefully you can see, you can see my slides. 
Yeah. Can't see them. Okay. Uh, great. Uh, so, uh, is that so, so we can we can see the um, the, the kind of um, presenter side. We can't see the full screen mode. Oh, I see. Sorry. What about now? There we go. Yeah, okay. great. Thank you. Um, so thank you, Daniel, for the giving the overview of the concept of what we're trying to do here. So what I will explain is on the molecular dynamic part of the work to link this to the to the uh, finite element side. So, uh, so molecular dynamics is part of one of the computational chemistry tools that we have. And we have this a multi-scale graph that we always show. And uh, in this project, we're interested in the all atom molecular dynamics, which lies with the uh, system size scales of about into the nanometers and the time scales of pico to nanoseconds. So we're, we're interested in doing this because this gives us a, a kind of detailed understanding from the molecular level point of view and um, and also understand how the this the this cocoa butter system uh, kind of evolves when we apply shearing um, in, in, and see that this time evolution of such systems so just a, an introduction of what molecular dynamics is all about so essentially what we're trying to do in molecular dynamics is solve Newton's equation of motion, which is force is equal to um, mass times ac acceleration. And so from there, we can kind of look at the evolution of a system for a given, a given time. And it's, it's a numerical integration of uh, this, e this equation. Um, and in order to, to, to calculate the force acting on each particle in the system for a given time step, we need to calculate the, the potential energy. So this is calculated based on the, the bonded and non-bonded interactions of the molecule that we are interested in the system. And for a specific material, for example, water or polymers, for example, for example, you have a specific parameters of these bonded interaction and non-bonded interaction. And these set of parameters are what we call force fields in within the mo molecular dynamic simulation. And charm is one of the force fields that, that we use here, and it's a well-developed force field that they mainly use for biological systems like proteins but this is also applicable for for the systems we're interested in here um so yeah we try to set up the system ba based on such parameters that we have and and then we run the, the simulation by integrating a numerical integration of of the the potentials that we have for a given time step. So these time steps could be up to a million, million time steps evolu of evolution of the system. So in order to understand the rheological properties, we wanted to calculate the friction coefficient based on the non-equilibrium molecular dynamic simulation. So how we set up the system is depicted on the, the, the image on the right. So um, because we're in the nanoscale, a meter we can just look take a slab of sucrose system instead of uh, doing the circular particle and uh, we have two sucrose surfaces and we uh, add in between them a cocoa butter and also a lecithine in this case and and we would share the system and from here we can extract the lateral uh, force and the force acting in the normal direction to get our uh, friction coefficient. And we also apply a, a high load in, or, in order to, um, to calculate the friction coefficient based on the Anton's Coulomb law and the high load. Um, so I have uh, three, four different systems that I, uh, I've set up in the in, for this study. The first one is where we have a uh, such setup but without the lecithin particles. So we, we simply have the cocoa butter in between the sucrose slabs, but we vary the amount of cocoa butter here. So the slab gap is increased systematically and I have three steps. 
a three slab caps system. Um, and then finally, in order to understand how this team plays, um, how sitting affects the viscosity of such system, then we, we add uh, this, the lipids in, in the, on the sucrose surface and apply shearing. So now I'll go into details of how we model the sucrose, cocoa butter, and the lysitin systems. So for sucrose, we know the crystal structure from the literature. So we, we get the, the parameters to, to set up the systems of the uh, sucrose unit cell. Here we have two sucrose molecules. Um, uh, we can get the exact structure of the crystal system from the crystal uh, crystal growth, growth sorry crystallography open database system and so I set up um, this initial configuration now here uh, in the molecular simulation each atom is represented as a single bead so as a single uh, position so we can get an um, atom detail uh, specification of such system. And using this unit cell, then um, I created the, the largest lab, which is about, this is about five nanometers in X direction and then another five nanometers in Y. So for molecular dynamics, this is quite large, but I guess for real system, uh, it, it's quite small. But to test this model, uh, we run the system at a constant volume and temperature, and we were able to see a stable crystal structure forming after 15 nanoseconds of simulation. And the density that we got was comparable to the experimental data. So we were quite happy with this setup. So the next stage was the modeling of the cocoa butter. So the cocoa butter is a model based on these triglyceride particles. Uh, and these are the three main components that consist of about 84% of the, the cocoa butter. So these are um, these are molecules that have these long hydrocarbon chains uh, chains. So Based on the, the percentage of the concentration we have of these three components, then we set up the, the cocoa butter system. Um, so the colors are uh, in this image on the left-hand side is the initial setup and they compare, they are the same color as, as I have listed on the right. Um, so we run the simulation uh, to a room temperature and about one bar simulation run an equilibration simulation to see how the density um, of the system is set up. So this is the, the result we've got. And um, so we, our results are shown in green. So we're getting slightly higher density than what is reported in the literature or also in previous molecular dynamic simulation. However, they've used a different set of uh, force fields to represent these um, cocoa butter system. So although we're slightly off, we, these values are comparable. So um, we were happy with this system. And you might not see here, but we've started at um, three different starting configuration for the higher temperature simulation we, we've got, and we were able to get similar density. So in the in terms of the lecithin, we know that uh, lecithin can be modeled based on this DLPPC um, lipid. There are also other lipids that we can apply, we can incorporate in this. However, the majority of the, the lecithin system is based on DLPC. So we've picked this, this uh, lipid for this study. And to, to set up the system, we've created two monolayers uh, to see how well they pack on water surfaces. And, and then we, 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 we ran the simulation and tested the packing area per lipid packing on water surface. Again, we were able to, to get a comparable results to what is known in, in the literature. 
So now let, let's go to the systems that I set up for the shearing simulation calculation. So on top, the, the top layer is uh, simply just wall because the molecular dynamic simulation, we have a periodic interaction. So to avoid these two sucrose surfaces from shearing uh, with each other, we've created this wall surface and this is kind of, um, this is fixed onto the um, onto that space, and this is the steps we've used to to equilibrate the system. First, we run a, at a constant temperature and volume um, at a temperature about 200, 320 Kelvin, and then we we apply pressure to equilibrate the system. As I said earlier, we apply a quite hard large load in Z direction in order to um, to calculate the friction coefficient based on the Anton's, Anton's equation law. So these are the, the steps for equilibration. So NPT is the constant number of particles and the pre constant pressure and temperature simulation. Um, the, I've set up these three systems with increasing amount of cocoa butter. You could see I simply um, duplicated for the second system and uh, three times for the third system of the cocoa butter we have uh, for, for this system. Um, and from the equilibrated system, we can get the density profile normal to the, to the interface to the surfaces, um, which is in, in Z direction. And what we can see here is that for the cocoa butter, there is some ordering that is seen near the sucrose surface. And this is actually what is expected or reported um, experimentally, or that there is some ordering of the cocoa butter particles on the sucrose surface. And the final system we have, the fourth system, is where we add the lecithin, which is modeled based on DLPC lipids. So experimentally, it's known that the, the, sucro, the DLPC particles absorb on the sucrose surface. So we started with adding the DLPC monolayer on the sucrose surface, and then on the sucrose surface on the top and bottom layer, and in the middle, we have the cocoa butter, um, co cocoa butter that we have modeled. So for the non-equilibrium molecular dynamics, in order to shear these two sucrose surfaces, we apply a harmonic potential. This is an external force that's been added to um, increase the velocity of these uh, sucrose slabs. At equilibrium simulation, we, would, we wouldn't see any drifting of this sucrose surfaces, so we apply uh, harmonic potential. And this is sheared at about one meter per second. And this, this is a um, high shearing rate compared to the experimental data, but computationally, if we were to run to shear this, that's very, um, very low shearing rate is not uh, feasible from molecular dynamics point of view. But at, for now, we've uh, picked just one meter per second. Uh, hopefully, we can go slightly lower than this value of this shearing rate. So now we'll show you um, a video of, of the molecular dynamics simulation where we shear the top and bottom layer of the sucrose surfaces in opposite direction. At the center here is, we only have the, the cocoa butter and this is for the lowest amount of cocoa butter that we simulate. What you can see is that we can see that this, um, this cocoa butter particles aligning in the direction that we are shearing, which is in, in the Y direction. And also there are, um, most of the, 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 sorry, it's running. Let's play that again. Let's 
Sorry, that's not, not working for some reason. So, okay, what I wanted to show is that uh, when we shear it, we see the slip behavior, but this is happening right at the center of the cocoa butter. We don't see the slipping of the sucrose, the cocoa butter at the sucrose surfaces. And on the right here is what, what we show the velocity profile in y direction. Uh, so normal to the to the slab. And what we can see is that um, there is a negative velocity for for the bottom uh, sucrose surface, which is because it's sheared in, in to the left direction and the top to the right, which has a positive velocity. And there is um, a, a slope, so a lin almost a linear profile of the velocity going from minus to a positive value for the cocoa butter surface. And this is for the fourth system where we add the DLPC lipid on the sucrose surfaces on top and bottom. Hopefully the video works. Yeah, great. So we see similar behavior here uh, where we see this slip behavior at the middle part of the cocoa butter. So we don't see any uh, shearing or slipping of the, this cocoa butter at the DLPC surfaces. So these, the, the sucrose, DLPC, and some of the cocoa butter kind of stuck together. And we only see the shearing uh, of the surfaces of the cocoa butter at the, uh, at the center of the box. And this is clear when we look at the velocity profile in y direction. So you can see the flat, flat velocity at around one meter per second, and then the, the gradient of the, the velocity for the cocoa butter. And it gets, again, it flattens for the DLPC, taking the same velocity as the, the cocoa butter. So from these simulations, we can extract the, the the lateral force, so the force we apply to shear this cocoa butter simulation. And this is, we can look at against a time. So what you can see, this is only for the systems with no uh, DLPC lipids in the, in the system. So just comparing the, the pulling force for different amount of uh, cocoa butter we have in the system. And what we can see, at, for most of the cases, so we we need uh, less force to we need less force to apply to the surface in order to to shear the system for the um, when we increase the the cocoa butter. So um, again, we also can get the pressure in normal direction. So from these two data, we can actually calculate the friction coefficient. By, by multiplying the pressure in normal by the cross-sectional cross area, we can get the normal force and the lateral force we can take from, from what, we, um, we, what we get from the simulation where we apply that harmonic potential in the simulation. So the friction coefficient we get, um, we, we get higher friction coefficient for the third system, which is, which is with the highest amount of cocoa butter between the slabs. And so what we see with the trend is, is that with the increasing amount of cocoa butter, the friction coefficient also increases. And these values are, um, are much higher than we expected. So we were expecting to have friction coefficient below one. And this is something we hope to study, uh, to look into in the future. So uh, this is for comparing the same, the same, the system with the same amount of cocoa butter, but the one in red has no DLPC but the one in blue has DLPC on the absorbed on the sucrose surfaces. From this profiles, what we could see here is that there's very little 
effect on the shearing property when we add DLPC on the system. This might be due to, to the fact that the, the shearing or the slipping that we see is at the center of the box where we, we, we can see only the shearing of the sucrose surfaces. Okay, in conclusion, what we could say is that we were able to model and simulate chocolate systems based on the, the co cocoa butter, uh, sucrose and DL DLPC, and, and the addition of um, lecithin based on DLPC um, model. And we were able to do a non-equilibrium molecular dynamics to study the the rheology of this chocolate and estimate the friction coefficient. Although the friction coefficient we've got were, were slightly higher than expected. So um, we, will, we will be investigating this in, in the future. And we also looked at the addition of lecithin in, the, uh, in this chocolate system and what effect does that have on the shearing property. So the next step is relating the, the friction coefficient that we've got to the experimental data, uh, like the Strybeck curve, um, and maybe varying the, the um, reducing the amount of cocoa butter between the sucrose surfaces even more, and to see that the raw, maybe sucrose sucrose friction coefficient that we get, and and see where we lie on this Strybeck curve. So we continue to collaborate with the ECFP on, on this project, and we are also hoping to get more funding to, to, to do further research based on the, the Hartree Center uh, funding program, the National Center for Digital Innovation. And we, we hope to extend this work to um, other systems as well. And thank you. So I pass you back to Daniel. Yeah, thanks, Edna. It was just a, a very quick couple of slides just to, to sort of talk about where we might go beyond chocolate as well. So um, here's the, the, the sort of the images I showed before as, as chocolate transitions from its dry granular state through to um, the, 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 the liquid state in H. And so if you just move the, the slide on a bit, basically what we did was to, to look in the literature and you can find very similar images for, for concrete. Uh, and also if you measure the, the power curve as a function of time for mixing chocolate, you get a very similar thing to, to, to the kind of behavior you see as you, as you add water to, to, to concrete and, and mix it. So there, it seems to be that there's some of the underlying physics is, is uh, very similar, which is, is good if our, if our understanding is correct. Then on the next slide, um, it's just to, to kind of show that there's some similar um, things. So in, in concrete, uh, First, for, for high strength concrete, you had super plasticizers, which reduce the water uh, content uh, by up to 15% or even more in some cases. So the, the kind of understanding there is that you're, you're facilitating higher solid content whilst retaining flowability. In effect, you're, you're changing phi M. Uh, the conventional understanding in, in super plasticizers is, is that they act as steric stabilizers, but you know, based on the, the work that we've done, uh, with a whole range of different dense suspensions. This is an open question. Perhaps they're acting as a, as a friction modifier. Um, and certainly if you just move the slide on um, to, to, yeah, so, you know, obviously cement, cement production uh, and concrete production more generally accounts for around 8% of global CO2 permission, uh, emissions um, production set to rise over the, over the next 30 years. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a key area that if, where we'd, we'd like to work in is just to, to help uh, try and understand concrete better and, and maybe uh, facilitate lower use of, of cement. Um, we didn't jump straight in with this system because the uh, the kinds of uh, molecules used for uh, as a super plasticizer are, are much more complicated. The system is in general is much more complicated. We have a, a gelling evolving system that, that hardens over time, uh, but we're hoping that our kind of understanding from from the experimental DEM and molecular dynamic simulations in this project will eventually lead on to, to more complex systems like this. And then just on the final slide, um, I just wanted to uh, say that, you know, that the frictional contact between particles is, is generic. It's important across a whole range of different sectors and, and you know, the approach that we're taking 
working from molecular level right through to, to kind of bulk bulk rheological uh, experimental methods. We're hoping can can inform specific industry formulation decisions. So ch chocolate is very much just one example. And uh, as certain mentioned, we're we're looking for industry collaborators to take this this work forward. So please do get in contact if uh, if this is of interest. And finally, just like to acknowledge our collaborators, Chris Ness uh, with the DEM simulations. Uh, Rick Anderson and Patrick Warren from the, the Hardry Centre and Wilson and Maria um, who've been working with us in, in, in Edinburgh and the funders, so the SDFC Food Network Plus, um, SDFC IAA money that we received and the Hardry for um, putting in some of the, the compute time and some of time more lately. So I think with that, if you just put our final slide, if you, yeah, here's, here's our respective uh, contact details and websites if you want to check any of that out and, and let us know. Thanks very much. Thanks a lot, Daniel and Zedan. Very interesting presentation. Um, so now um, it would be time for an open floor discussion and Q&A session. So if you have any questions, um, please feel free to type it um, in the chat box or you can use the raise hand function on Zoom as well. Um, and we already have a few questions from our participants um, in the chat box, um, including one from Sonel. So should we start with um, questions from um, Nicolene? Um, Nicolene, do you want to ask your questions here now? Oh, oh, I can just read out um, her questions so everyone can hear. So um, Nicolene's question is, um, in an immersed such as this, you almost always have a film coating. So mechanical friction, repose angle does not play such a role. When you consider the shape, um, it's non-spherical. Um, the surface area and geometry dominates creating areas of varying uh, packing density and shear strength. Has been considered um, as seems a lot of this is based on sphere packing, which is significantly different to real world materials or um, are the cocoa or sugar particles in this study indeed close to spherical? Um, so that's Nicolene's question. Sure, I could start, start by, by tackling some of this. So um, thanks for the question. The, so the, 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 the kind of the, the generic behavior I showed to start with in terms of phi m is, is, is not limited to spheres. That, that's generic across, um, across particles. And there's, indeed, there's been lots of work looking at different shaped particles and, and how they pack. Um, so, you know, it, Sucrose particles are certainly not spheres. They're, they're kind of faceted um, angular particles. Uh, I just showed spheres for kind of simplicity. There has been a lot of work done on, on model systems, um, uh, you know, including PMMA spheres and silica spheres and, and, and the like, but also we've, we've done a lot of work on sucrose, on calcite particles and, and various other different things. And the, the, the generic physics that, that underpins the packing of these systems is, is, is just that, it's generic. Um, the, the understanding is the same. On the thin films, um, this, this, this is actually a kind of relatively recent paradigm shift in the dense suspension community. Um, so over the last 10, 10 years, there's been quite a lot of work done looking at how um, particular phenomenology known as shear thickening uh, happens. So this is where you, you know, at low stresses, uh, or typical or low shear rates, the, the system is in a low viscosity state, but as you increase the stress, it transitions to a, to a high shear state. If you think about cornstarch and water, that's the kind of archetypal example. So if you, if you hold it in your hand, it will run through your fingers, but you can either run on it or punch it and it turns solid. Um, the kind of key piece of understanding uh, in, in, in recent years that um, we've come to is actually contact, particle particle contacts is, is crucial to understanding that physics. Um, and we've, you know, we've done things like shear reversal experiments where we've actually separated out the, the contact and hydrodynamic components. So in essence, the, the, the film, the lubrication film between particles does break down at some, some point, and then it is valid to think about the, the kind of fictional uh, interaction between particles. Um, does that answer most of the question? Yeah, so uh, just in terms of, of, of the, the, the way that things pack, you know, obviously phi RCP or random close packing or frictionless um, packing, maximum packing friction for spheres is about 64%. And it's about, for the frictional case, it's about you know 57%. But for different shaped particles, different polydispersities, et cetera, we just shift those, those 
absolute values around, but the, the kind of generic behavior remains the same. Great, thanks, Danny. Um, we have another question from Kathy. Um, so Kathy, do you want to ask a question here or should I just read out your question from the chat box? Hi, Cindy. No, I'm quite happy to uh, ask my question personally. Um, I think you've sort of answered some of it. I was interested, obviously the sugar particles are very angular and they're also of different sizes. So the bulk rheology will have particular properties depending on the shapes and the size. Um, and I understand you're looking at the very close molecular rheology, if you like. Is there a way that you can marry the two findings to actually give you really useful information on what's happening in the in the conching process um, and then consequently afterwards. And my second part of it was, I assume you've done all these studies at temperatures well over 60 degrees centigrade, sorry, I should be talking Kelvin, um, to, to remove the influence of cocoa butter crystals. Um, when they start to form, and the whole system starts to set up, how would they influence the rheology, do you think? Or have you um, not studied that yet? So on, on your second point first, um, so in the paper we published in 2019, all of that work was done in a model uh, chocolate system. So we had sucrose particles suspended in um, some sunflower oil, which had some of it, the, the kind of surface active components removed. So it was it was, there was no, crystallization process that could, could take place. It was just a, a, a pure um, liquid background. Um, to, to, your, to your first point, how do you sort of um, reconcile the, the kind of maximum packing? So the, the, so I, I kind of glossed over it in my, my explana explanation um, of the contouring process, but what we find generally is that the higher the initial volume fraction of your system, the, the, the more well conched it is um, in that once you dilute that system down with sunflower oil, you can reach lower viscosities. Um, so what that means is that there, there is a, and, and that's typically, you know, and, and certainly in the systems we were using in, in, in our labs, we had a, a planetary mixer, which moves us at a fixed, shear rate. So that means that the, the higher the, um, the viscosity of the system by adding more solid particles at a fixed rate, the more stress you can apply to the system. So, so the, the kind of efficiency of breaking down aggregates is, is, is higher at higher volume fractions. So that means there, in, there is also a coupling to, for instance, when you add the lesser thin, if you put the lesser thin at the start, you would probably not end up with as well a conched or as well a de-aggregated system as, as if, if what, what they do in industry is, is put the bulk of it in it at the end. Um, did, does that go some way to answering the question? Um, yes, I think so. Um, I was just I mean, wondering whether you could explain a bit about how the understanding you have from the um, nano scale uh, at the surface of the crystal, sugar crystal, um, relates to the bulk properties. Okay, yeah. So, so or maybe I'm just not understanding your answer, so no, I apologize. That, so that, no, that's, that's, fine. that's fine. So, so what, what the understanding is that, that the interparticle friction coefficient uh, modifies the bulk behavior uh, basically by either constraining particles to slide past each other or, or constraining them to, to roll past each other. So at high friction, they have to roll past each other and consequently, because the system's more constrained, you get a lower uh, maximum volume fraction, which, which through the sort of creaker doherty relation, if you like, it, it drives this, the system viscosity. So what we're trying to probe in, in this study was from a molecular standpoint, can we extract a friction coefficient to say put into the DEM simulations, which we already know well describe the the, the experimental um, experimental uh, measurements we've we've made? Because you know if, if you either in in the chocolate industry or in other industries, if you wanted to say replace lesser thin with something else, 
you know, how do you do that in a rational way um, without just sort of searching every every chemical out there? You, you have to sort of understand what the current thing is doing so you can kind of rationally uh, exchange it. Um, so I, from, from that standpoint, what, what we're trying to do is extract a, a friction coefficient, which we can then put into the higher level DEM modeling and then compare to experiment um, to kind of move right through all those, those different length scales. Yeah, I do, I do get I, get, I do get the uh, motive behind, um, and I, I think it's it's very valuable. Um, so, have you just done the studies with oil, or have you done it with cocoa butter at a liquid state? Uh, we we have done some some work with the the cocoa butter liquid state. We we confirmed early on in our work that the the, the model system represents, you know, apart from the kind of crystallization setting process, it represents the, the, the liquid chocolate system very well. And my yeah. other question was, um, have you tried the model system without the cocoa butter, but with just lecithin? So sugar, lecithin, sugar? Experimentally, that that wouldn't be possible. They're just, they're, the system would be a dry powder, but I, I guess in the in the simulation where you can bring those two surfaces right down close together that is on the on the to-do list what one of the things we would like to do is to be able to um change the the setup so you can as as those two surfaces come together you can squeeze out the cocoa butter from the from the contact area uh, and, and bring those phospholipid surfaces into contact and, and see what that that looks like and finally um do you think that if you had prolonged shearing you would see some sort of separation of the phospholipid components. Separation of the P, POP, the SOS, and so forth. Because it looks to me like they they might be beginning to laminate almost. Oh, the cocoa butter components. You mean? Yes. Yeah, sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a a good question. I I don't know. I mean. I guess we haven't run the, the yeah at the moment they just slip in through but yeah I, and they they're yeah that they they're positioning along the shearing rate but then yeah they're not separating it's very interesting thank you thanks Thank you, Kathy and Danny and Zeta. Um, we have another question from Robert, uh, but I think he is not in the room now. So um, his question is, is this work published already? I'm interested to see how you implemented the shear. I'm assuming it's a combination of position restraint plus pool coat. Yeah, so the, this work is not published yet. Um, we need to start writing the paper, but um, we didn't... We used uh, the molecular dynamics code called Gromax, and this has an implementation of the pulling code. Um, so we, we can easily apply the shearing of the system by just uh, yeah setting setting up the system using the that pulling code they have implemented. Right. Um, so um, there's one um, other question from Sono. Um, so she has left her question before she left the room. So her question is on um, how can we extend the impact of this research and what more support SFM plus can provide in scaling this up? And it would be great if you could share your plans for scaling up this research. Um, yeah, well, I, I guess I, I guess there's, there's two things that we, we want to do. We want to continue this this um, the, the chocolate work that we're doing. So we're, we're hoping to get some additional resource through the HNCDI funding that uh, that Seddon mentioned. Um, but 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 equally, we are also keen to to broaden this out to potentially other industrial sectors, you know, which who, who work with with dense suspensions and and want to be able to sort of link the, the kind of molecular level description or the kind of formulation decisions from a, from a kind of ingredient standpoint right through to the, the bulk rheology. Um, so yeah, it'd be interesting to explore what additional support the food network uh, can, can provide in, in this case. So it'd be, I'm not sure what, what uh, options are available. 
Um, but yeah, that'd be, be good to explore. Right, thanks. Um, so are there any other questions for the speakers from um, the audience? Right. Um, if not, um, I guess um, that would be um, the end of the presentation session today. So thank you so much again, Daniel and Zedan, um, for the very interesting presentation. And um, Daniel and Zedan um, have left the email in the presentation slides. Uh, or if you don't mind, um, you can share your email address in the chat box um, again, so that our audience can email you if they have any questions about your research. Yeah. Yeah, shared mind. And thanks, thanks very much for uh, listening, everyone. The questions it was good to have some feedback on the work. Yeah, great. Oh, thanks very much. Um, and we hope to see you all again um, in our webinar next month.